lečia ja hipi čarila i čante maštelo. Le ampetu kile, which hoje wowapi. He ki he echa i wowaglaking telo. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for coming to this session. I'm going to be talking about uh, the new Lakota dictionary and about its online version. I'm going to spend the first 15 or perhaps 20 minutes talking about why there was a need for a new dictionary at all, because there have been Lakota dictionaries that existed for a long time. So why should we have a new dictionary? I'm going to try and uh, give you some information about that. And after that, I will demonstrate and show you the functionalities uh, of the online dictionary and explain why it is a very convenient thing to have an online dictionary accessible to everyone. The earlier dictionaries on Lakota language had a lot of problems and limitations. First of all, they were all done by, uh, the, not all, but most of the big dictionaries were done by missionaries by people who didn't really hear the differences, subtle differences in pronunciation of Lakota language. And so they established orthographies or writing systems that didn't capture the sound system of the language properly. Uh, moreover, they introduced a large number of mistakes and errors in those dictionaries. When I started learning Lakota language 20 some years ago, I started learning from the Bikol Dictionary, and I studied it for a number of years, five or seven years, and then I came to Lakota country and stayed with some families. And I was surprised that, uh, although I understood and could communicate quite a bit, I found out that a lot of the words I learned from the Bikol Dictionary were not recognized, so the people didn't understand what I was trying to say. The words that I learned, that I had learned from the Bikul Dictionary were not recognized by the people that I talked to. And so I thought, well, maybe it's because it's an old dictionary and the people don't no longer use these old words. But as I researched it more and more, it became clearer and clearer that that wasn't really the case. A lot of the words in the Bikul Dictionary really aren't Lakota words. And I will show you examples and will demonstrate why I am convinced that it is the case. One of the words that I learned from the Bikul Dictionary is the word oglu, which is defined in the dictionaries as luck and fortune. I learned it sometime in 1986 and then I came to Lakota country in the early 90s and uh, I used it. Nobody understood me. And then I, throughout the years of working with the language, of doing research for the dictionary, I kept asking people, do you know this word oglu? Nobody knew it. I counted the number of people that I asked about oglu and it's now been over a hundred of fluent native speakers, old and young, some of the very old fluent speakers who have passed away years ago. None of them knew the word oglu. And the word, if you look at its history, first occurred in the Riggs Dakota Dictionary. Riggs was a missionary among the Dakota people uh, around the 1840s and 50s. That's where the, the word originated, 1852. Then it was reprinted in the new edition of the same dictionary some 40 years later. Then the word occurred again in a manuscript of a Lakota dictionary written by a missionary stationed in Pine Ridge whose name was Perig, Emil Perig, I believe. It occurs again in the famous Beekles Lakota Dictionary, published for the first time in 1970. And again in a Lakota dictionary known as Everyday Lakota, very popular, small, yellow dictionary, I'm sure you're familiar with it, written by a missionary in uh, Rosebud whose name was Carol, 1971, again, Oglu. 
the Beko dictionary, uh, the Riggs dictionary, was reprinted 100 years later in 1992, and the word is there again. It's a Dakota dictionary, but it has some Lakota words in it, so it has a glue. A British linguist, whose name is Bruce Ingham, compiled a Lakota dictionary from written sources, mostly using older dictionaries, and he has the word oglu again. And finally, the Beekle Lakota dictionary, originally published in 1970, was republished, edited by Manherd in 2002, quite recently. He, it has that blue cover, uh, published by Nebraska Press, and it has the word oglu again. So we can see a hundred and fifty years old history of a word that nobody in the Lakota country recognizes as a Lakota word. So what's going on? Are all of those hundred uh, and, and some odd speakers that I talked to uh, who, who, didn't, who said they don't know such word as Oglu, are they all wrong? Or what's going on? I did a lot of research, not only with speakers, but also with old written materials. One of the key figures in Lakota language documentation and in Lakota dictionary creation was Ella Deloria. She was herself a native speaker of Lakota, even though she was born as a Yankton Dakota person. Her parents were both Dakota. She, she started speaking Dakota, but when she was one year old, her parents moved to Standing Rock, and she grew up, uh, grew up in a community, a Lakota-speaking community. So she became fluent in Lakota. Now, when she graduated, she started working, after she graduated, she started working on Lakota materials, and one of the projects that she did with the famous anthropologist Franz Boas was that she took the old Riggs Dictionary, published in uh, 1852, and on the margin of the dictionary, she wrote what she knew to be the Lakota versions of the Dakota words. She did it for all the 21,000 words of the Dakota dictionary. And in most cases, she knew the, the word and she wrote it, but in very, very, very many cases, she put a question mark there, either because she didn't know the Lakota equivalent, or because she questioned the existence of a word that Riggs gave to be, to be Lakota. And as you can see, this is the case of the word Oglu. She put a question mark there. I digitized everything that uh, Riggs Beekle and Deloria and others wrote, and I put it all into a database. I merged them all together, uh, getting a large database of about 40,000 words. And then I went and visited speakers for many, many years and, and discussed all the words with them. And all the speakers, I have to repeat, that I asked about Oglu agreed with Deloria. They didn't know what the word is. So 150 years of Lakota and Dakota dictionaries, there is a word that nobody knows. How can that happen? Beekle Dictionary says this, and he gives us a clue of what happened. He says, Oglu is a noun. It means luck, fortune, and it's used in these collocations. Oglu washte means good luck. Oglu shicha means bad luck. And those of you who are native speakers, can see the clue here, because I'm sure you recognize the word oglushicha. Tona lakolia inichakapi na peyuhatapo na inch dakota. Oglushicha, what does that mean? Oglushicha. It's a word. Yeah, you mess something up, you make a mistake, you make an error. So oglushicha really is a word. It's supposed to be one word, not two, as Beekle wrote it. It means to make a mistake. Oglushicha, I made a mistake. But the missionaries misinterpreted the word. They said it means bad luck, which it doesn't. 
And they thought, well, if oglu shicha means bad luck, then oglu washte must mean good luck, and then oglu must mean luck. Is that so? Those of you who are native speakers, do you recognize oglu as a word by itself, and oglu washte as good luck? You recognize that? No yes there, or? So far, the many speakers I've asked, nobody recognized that. So we see how misinterpretation introduces errors and how errors persist throughout time for 150 years. In all the dictionaries that there are, the word is there. And that is the reason why there was a need for a new dictionary, because this error is not the only one. It's an example of errors that count not dozens and not hundreds, but thousands. There are thousands and thousands problems of problems like this one in the older dictionaries. And that's not even to begin, beginning to mention the problems of spelling. Father Beekle at least tried to spell the words based on the on the sound, but after he passed away, Father Manhart took his manuscript and changed, converted the orthography that used age as an aspiration. He changed it, and he did so inconsistently, introducing thousands of rampant errors into the Beagle Dictionary. So the, the orthography used in the Beagle Dictionary is really inconsistent, and when someone tells you I don't want to use this new orthography because I'm using Beacles. Well, really, there is no such orthography as Beacles because it's all inconsistent. It's ad hoc. So I explained how that misinterpretation happened and how they borrowed from each other. These two gentlemen are the two who started it. They were missionaries, Gideon and Samuel Pond, uh, Ponds, they were brothers who were missionaries among the Dakota in the 1830s. And they made a big collection of Dakota words. Um, later on, Stephen Riggs took upon or, or continued in their work and published the first Dakota dictionary in 1852. Thomas Williamson also recorded words but he, more than recording, he translated. He tried to translate English into Dakota. I'll later show you some examples of his translations. This is Riggs and the cover of the 1992 edition of the dictionaries. All of these Dakota dictionaries have hundreds and thousands of errors in them, not only in spelling, but also in the meaning of words. And here is why. The first person that they worked with was Michael Renville, who was a mixed blood, whose mother, I think, was French and father was a Dakota. Perhaps it was the other way around. I don't remember it right now. So he was bilingual in French and Dakota. And the missionaries were in, interested in translating the Bible into the Dakota language. And this is how they did it. They read the Bible in French to Michael and asked him to translate it into Dakota. But Michael's Dakota wasn't really as fluent and native and as good as a, per, as a Dakota of a person who grew up monolingual, speaking Dakota only. It was really semi-fluent, somewhat broken. So if you read the Dakota Bible today, you will see a lot of things that sound very awkward. Anybody read the Dakota Bible? Are there some things that you found slightly weird? Well, this is why. Michael Renville's Dakota was not that good. So he introduced a lot of problems grammatically and in terms of words. Now, Pond Brothers and Riggs took those words from the Bible and put them to the Dakota dictionaries. And then Beekle came, began his mission in Pine Ridge in 1902, and he took the existing Dakota dictionaries looked at them and he thought, well, these two languages are related, so why don't I just take the Dakota words, change the L into the D, uh, change the D into L, and I have a Lakota dictionary. Not only did a lot of the Dakota words were wrong, 
because they came from Michael Renville's poor Dakota, but you cannot convert Dakota words into Lakota simply by converting the phonology. It does not work that way, because there are many words that are different. I am hungry in Lakota is Loachi. I am hungry in Dakota is Wotewahada. You cannot change Wotewahada into some sort of a Wotewagla. That's not a Lakota word. You cannot convert one dialect to another simply by replacing the sounds. It does not work. But that's exactly what Father Beekle did. And ha from there, we have thousands of words in the Beekle dictionary that are not really words or Lakota words. Here is John Williamson, who was son of the earlier Williamson that I showed earlier. And he wrote a uh, an English Dakota dictionary published in 1902 and republished 90 years later. His approach was not to collect Dakota words, but to translate them. So he came to a Dakota speaker and he asked him, well, how would you say to suffer? How would you say to die? And so forth. And I want to give you some examples. He asked a speaker, how would you say oath, pledge? And the translation he was given was, which means pronouncing the God's name, I think, something like that. Calling the God by his name, or calling Wakantanka, if you will. However, in his dictionary, you will not find any of these words that really are used for oath or pledge in Dakota and Lakota. Words like ich ichunza, iwaho ichia, wo ich ichdaka, awasu ichia. These all mean to make an oath, to make a pledge, but they're not in the dictionary. Instead, he has some sort of a wrong translation of that, of that word. Another example is he wanted to know how to say to peek at something. And what he wrote was, What does that mean, Dakota speakers? You're looking at something from under. So it's some sort of a literal translation of what someone thought to peek at means. But to peek at in Dakota and Lakota, we have a good word for it. Eokasi. Ahiokasi. Right? That's the good word that we use. I've never heard an expression like that in Lakota or Dakota. It doesn't make sense. And the whole Williamson Dictionary is full of these weird translations. I could give you uh, hundreds of examples, but we don't have time to go through all of them. So this was just a short introduction to show why there really was a need for a new Lakota dictionary. A lot of people are in denial of that. They say, oh, we don't need a new dictionary. We have a good old dictionary but by Bickel. Oh, we don't need a, a dictionary compiled by a German guy, meaning me because I have a German surname, and I'm not a German. I just happen to have a German surname. We have our good old dictionary by Beekel, who, by the way, was German, really. <laughs> so it's, it's funny. A lot of people are in denial. There is no need. But the consistency of spelling that was introduced in the new dictionary is something that was needed for 400 years now. Because the mess that the missionaries introduced by the inconsistent spelling is something that we're struggling with till this day. People don't want to recognize there is a need to mark the sound. Because the missionaries didn't hear the sound. They didn't hear the difference between k, k, and k. And they wrote those three sounds all by one letter, k. And that's where the problems began. So here's Father Beekle. He meant well. I don't mean to be critical about any of those old missionaries. I think they were just trying to do their best, but they were not trained as linguists, linguists and they were not native speakers. Their primary goal, of course, was to, to create liturgical texts in the languages. And they did their best, but very often they introduced mistakes by misinterpretation or by borrowing words from older dictionaries and so forth. I already mentioned that Beekel borrowed words and word entries from Riggs very heavily. In fact, in the archive where Beekel's possessions are stored today, 
you can find the Riggs Dictionary with Beekle's notes on the margins, how he was converting the Dakota words into Lakota. And when I digitized it and put it into database, I found out that 90% of all definitions in Beekle are identical to the definitions given by Riggs. 90%. And most of the others are similar. So Beekle simply tried to Lakotize the Dakota words of Riggs. And here is the sequence as it went. We had an unidiomatic Dakota translation of Bible by Michael Renville that started in the 1830s and 40s. From there, they took the words into the Dakota dictionaries, Riggs, Williamson, and others. From there, it was borrowed into Beekle and many other dictionaries, as we saw. And there we go, a large number of research papers, dictionaries, and dissertations that all work with mistakes that are 170 years old. And people who are in denial and saying, we don't need a new dictionary because we already have good dictionaries. So unfortunately, that was the history of Lakota and Dakota dictionaries. And I already mentioned in the beginning that when I learned from the Beekle Dictionary and came back to Lakota country, many of the words I used people didn't understand, recognize, because they were not Lakota words. So I was curious and I started interviewing people, recording, and it was a work that took 20 years, and the result of that is the new Lakota Dictionary, as I think you know it, that red cover. And it's, uh, I'm only a tool, uh, an editor, who edited what people told me. What they recorded, I typed it down. I, the interpretation and translation that they gave me, I compared. Every single word was checked with more than two speakers. So it's usually a combination of, of you know, uh, opinions on, or approaches to every single word. Now, the printed version of the dictionary is something that I, am, I suppose most of you know. Now we have put that dictionary online. This is the website where the new Lakota dictionary is online, and I want to introduce you to some of, the, some of its features. Here are two in, um, input fields. An input field for an English word, if you're looking for a meaning, uh, a Lakota equivalent of an English word, you type it here. If you're looking for a Lakota word, you type it here. I'll show you an example. There's also an integrated keyboard. If you know the standardized Lakota layout, you can simply type it on your physical keyboard and it will use this. If you don't know it, you can click on it with your mouse. So let's say uh, I'm a beginner and I want to know how to say woman in Lakota. I'll type it here, press enter, and I will receive the entry of the dictionary that has a number of words for woman, uh, adult woman, old woman, young woman, and so forth. Now, I am curious about one of those possible meanings, for example, young woman. So if I click on Wikhoshkalaka, I'm instantly taken to the Lakota side and given the Lakota entry for that woman where I can read example sentences and usages and conjugations and so forth. So the two sides of the dictionary interact together. Now, there is a young woman. I want to, to know how to say young. So I click on young and I'm taken back to the English side and given the entry for the word young. So you can see you can keep clicking and, and look for things uh, in a way that the two sides of the dictionary interact. So I'm interested in the word tchecha, to be young. Taken back to the Lakota uh, section. And if I scroll down, I can see the conjugation of the verb ma tchecha ni tchecha, but the printed version of the dictionary only gives the first singular, sometimes the second singular, and always the first plural. If I want to see the full conjugation, I click on this image. Uh, doesn't work on this. It's, it's a work in progress, I should have said it in the beginning. Let's look at the word washte. So I want to know the conjugation of washte. I click on this image down here, and I'm given a full conjugation table. I have to decrease the size for you to see it. Can you see it? 
which tells me first singular, second singular, third singular, first dual, you and I are good, and I'm given a full conjugation table, a tool that's very useful for all students who want to learn how to conjugate, or simply check if they are conjugating their verbs correctly. Um, it's a work in progress. We don't have a conjugation for all verbs, but we're working on it, and we're very close to having all verbs. Please, question. What about there's the English, I mean, a woman's version and a man's version? Do you address that also? Uh, yes, that's addressed in the dictionary and usage notes. If a word is used by a woman only, there's a usage note that this is only used by women. Um, now, you can also search for words that are conjugated, and those are most difficult for students. If students w find such a word as mawashte and look it up in the dictionary, you will not find mawashte, because that's not a uh, simple form, it's a conjugated form. But you can type it in the online dictionary, mawashte, press enter, and look, the online dictionary will find the entry of the word mawashte, because mawashte is first singular of washte. So the dictionary takes you to the proper entry, even if you don't know the conjugated form. Does that make sense? Do you all understand what I mean? Um, Yes. I'm trying to code out, but I noticed the English is kind of backwards on how we would say stuff. But if I were to say that singular, uh, I would say question or who? That's a different. That's a different use of the word. I in Lakota, I think we would say tayan wa un. Washte wa un doesn't sound quite uh, grammatical to me. But if it's singular, if somebody's asking me that question, that's how we would say it. All right, that's perhaps how we'd say it in the old community. Uh, here we would say. Well, you are on a level of a phrase. You have two words. I'm talking about a level of conjugating a single word like mawashte, I'm, I'm good, or chante mawashte, I'm glad, chante ni washte, chante un washte, you and I are glad. That's conjugating of a single verb. So a uh, uh, level of a phrase, I'll get to that. I'll get to phrases as well. Um, so the dictionary entry, each dictionary entry has the definition of the word, example sentences, uh, usage comments, such as, is it used by uh, which gender, uh, conjugation comments, and so forth. Let me try and show you another word, take. I want to know how to say take. And one of the many words for take is ichu. There are many others, but let's click on ichu. And if I scroll down, I am given other forms of the verb ichu. Ikikchu, ikichu, iich ikchu, ikichichu, ikichichu, and so forth. Ekichu, ahiichu, agliichu, and so forth. And these are various grammatical forms like possessives, datives. And if I click on them, I can learn more. See? I clicked on ikichu and I was taken to the entry of that dative form of ichu. So these are some of the basic functionalities. Another thing that we're hoping to do, we just uh, wrote a grant to receive, uh, to find funds to do that, is to record every single entry word and possibly even the uh, example sentences, have them recorded by fluent speakers, so that when you click on the word, you will hear it pronounced, you will hear the sentence read or said by the native speaker. So that's our next enhancement of the online dictionary. Uh, Another thing that we are working on is a type of a literal translation of texts, and I'm going to uh, demonstrate or, or uh, show you an example of that. If you have a text and you type it in the forum, or someone else, has, else typed it and you want to read it, you want to uh, improve your Lakota by reading, which is an important skill, but you come up against uh, come up uh, against a word that you don't know. Uh, everybody knows ampetu, but maybe not everybody knows 
catching. So I double click on catching and I'm instantly given the dictionary entry of that word. So it's a tool that can help me learn word, new words that I don't know. Can help the students learn words that they don't know. This feature will eventually work on conjugated verbs uh, as well. Uh, it's not quite there yet, but we're getting very close to the point where every form of a word will be recognized this way. So you can see I, I, I can simply click away and are, I'm given the dictionary entries of each word that I click on. So these are some of the functionalities of the online dictionary. And um, do you have any questions or comments? What is it? And it's free. It's a, it's a free service. You just need to register for the forum. Prosim? It took a lot of commitment and a lot of work on the um, side of um, our programmer who's been volunteering most of his work. And, uh, and of course, it uh, took the 20 years of research on the new Lakota Dictionary. Um, so it took a lot of work, but it's all worth it. The language is worth it. And now we just need the community to start using it, implementing it, and, and make good use of it for the sake of the future of the language. Please. That's Yes. It was over 300 of native speakers in the course of 20 years. Many of them are now diseased, unfortunately. They haven't seen the result of their contribution because they spent a lot of time with me recording stories or helping me interpret words. And, and those are the true authors of the dictionary. I'm just an editor. I'm just someone who put it together. But the, the true authors of the dictionary are those uh, 300 and more speakers who took their time and, and made the effort to help put uh, the dictionary together. And I also get the comment from speakers uh, very often. They say, I read the dictionary, and I find a lot of words that I used to hear from my parents, but I don't remember them myself anymore. So reading the dictionary really helps me bring back those older words that my, uh, the, the generation of my parents and grandparents read. And, and that's one of the many purposes of dictionaries. Bring back the old words, reinforce the language with, with the dictionary. Please. It's, uh, you know, like San River, right? Just like all the reservations, border towns, towns right inside the public schools. Right inside the reservation, that actually, to say 80% of the children. Right. And the students going to the K-12, and Impact A is going to the school. So a lot right. of the stuff, they should be incorporated in those public schools in order for the teachers that some teach German or Spanish, but the majority of the students are like, you know, so that, how would you, it's up to you. You have to go to those schools. You have to go to the school boards. You have to create pressure that uh, Lakota language instruction in school in all schools have to increase its quality by sending teachers to quality training, by making all teachers literate, and by stop making the excuses that Lakota is our language. It doesn't need to be written and that it doesn't have to have diacritics, and we don't need all of this because we have our Biko orthography. Uh, you know, all of these excuses have to stop, and we have to create 
pressure on the administrators of the schools, increase the quality of Lakota language instructions. Today there are the tools. There are dictionaries that are consistent, that use consistent spelling based on the sound of the language, unlike the old dictionaries. There, are, there is curriculum that's consistent. It's up to you people to create that kind of movement and pressure. I'm just saying that, you know, I probably need all your information I like to promote that in the community. Right. And you saw in the in the teachers when I was going to school there back in the seventies, we had elder woman and man in the classroom and they were teaching us and it was difficult for us, you know. Right. But but now that you know, even if you have that, we don't have that now. We had books. Right. We never had something like this. Sure. Let me make an important comment. Uh, technolo technology and tools like the online dictionary are very useful. But they, are, they can only be useful if you have committed people to use them. Okay? You can have the best dictionary and the best curriculum and textbooks, but if you don't have committed and trained teachers, it doesn't make any difference. Okay? It's only the committed ones who will benefit from this. But if you think, okay, we'll, we'll buy something, we'll buy books, and, uh, and uh, we'll use a dictionary, but you don't have teachers who know how to use it effectively, then it, will be, it won't make any difference, it won't help. You need to have committed people who are open-minded to new methodologies of, of teaching and learning, and then these tools will be very useful and helpful and will make teaching effective. Please. I'll give you the address how you how you get can get uh, on it. This is the address of the Lakota language forum. It's free. You just need to register to create an account for yourself. And when you do that, please remember your login name and password because then people email us, oh, I forgot my password. And it's a lot of work for us, extra work, to try and, and reset uh, uh, hundreds of, of people who just don't remember it. Currently, the forum has uh, over 2,000 members from all over the world, people who are interested in Lakota, but around 400 Lakota or Dakota people who want to learn the language. Uh, no, but there are Dakota members who participate, who write in Dakota or read Lakota texts, don't mind doing that. We, we welcome everybody, so if you want to participate, that's all right. All we ask, the purpose of the forum is to promote literacy and to promote consistency in reading and writing. That's one of our main goals and purposes. There is a denial about that in Lakota country, there, is, there are a lot of people who say Lakota is an oral language and we don't need to write it and read it because it's an oral language. But from an experience of someone who's been working with endangered languages for many years, I tell you that if Lakota people are not literate and if they don't use the language for literary purposes, it will not survive into the 21st century. It will not. These young people that you see here, they're all about literacy. They're texting every day. Are you texting every day? On your cell phones? Do you send emails? It's all, today's world is all about writing and reading. If you are illiterate, you will not find work. And if Lakota language is not a language of literacy, it will not survive. It's as simple as that. And the young people will not be interested in learning the language unless they can do things with it that they are interested in. And one of the things they are interested in is texting, sending emails, reading funny things, reading comics, uh, and what have you, and a lot of that is written. So that Lakota is an oral language is simply an excuse. And that someone says, we don't need an orthography that's consistent is another excuse that they just don't want to learn something new. They think it's difficult, but it's not. If you saw the movie just uh, a little while ago, you saw if you needed to learn Chinese and Japanese, you would have to learn thousands of difficult letters. Well, now here you just need to learn two diacritics and where to put them. That's all. It's very easy.
Very easy to do. But you have to have the open mind and you have to have the commitment. If you are a native speaker, take your time every day and read a page of the dictionary. The example sentences all come from fluent native speakers and they tell stories about Lakota culture, about Lakota history, about Lakota life. And if you read a page every day, you will eventually understand how the orthography works, how it supports the pronunciation, and you will become literate in reading Lakota. And you can even become literate in writing Lakota. But it takes time and commitment. It won't happen by itself. Please. There's a, there's a mindset of elders I realized that with my father, too. You know, he wanted me to speak my culture all the time. I was going to school because we had to learn English. All that writing and all that. But he would get upset with me because I wasn't speaking my culture at home. Or when I grew up, when I was born, that's my, that was the first language in the house. I hope you so somehow we got to break that barrier and that mindset that we learn the, 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 the language at home, at home, and that's where it's spoken uh, at that young age where you're going to get in when you get older. Even if you're recorded to school, you're a fluent speaker, and then you go into pre-K and whatever, you can still retain that, that language. But that's where we're, we're dropping the ball as a, as a focused speaking people. Is that, that age group right there, right there is, is critical because you can retain that when you go into school and you have this kind of information out there to reinforce that. I, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of this struggle and the trauma that has happened because of the boarding school experience and because of, of uh, the lack of support for Lakota language is real and it needs to be addressed but it must not be used as, as a way of saying, oh, well, we're, we're victims of this. Right. Well, the healing is, the healing really, the answer for healing is, what are you going to do about that? Are you going to let that historical trauma stop you from saving the language? That's the healing. That's the answer. Okay? It's nobody's fault. There's no single person. It's not your father's fault. It's nobody fault that they didn't speak to their children. Sometimes people feel guilty. I could have spoken to my children, I didn't. Those choices were difficult to make in times when there was pressure and all of that. Right. Well, the only way you can break it is to make people realize, ask them, what are you going to do about that? Are you going to complain? Be a victim? Or are you going to be a go-getter and say, I'm going to save this language. I'm going to make my own contribution by learning or by teaching. If you're a fluent speaker, find someone you can teach. Find someone you can speak to. Speak to your children or grandchildren. Don't speak English. Uh, so many times native speakers critique curriculum and teaching in, in, in uh, schools and they say, it doesn't work if we teach the language in schools because when they go home that nobody speaks to them. And I said, all right, why don't you speak then? It's up to you to speak at home. Don't critique, speak. Uh, if you're interested in these issues, I'm going to address many more of these issues in my next talk. So you're invited to go there. Uh, many more of these controversial issues. So uh, how, how much we are about the end, but a few more comments or questions, please. I want to make a comment on, I'm at Will Mayor. Thank you.
kind of coffee shop and coffee. And it inspired me that because in my travels, I hear people talking their language. And when I when I when I meet that association with somebody that speaks our language, it's kind of it's, to me it makes me feel good that our culture is we're still alive. Our language is still alive. And I'm, I'm really I'm really impressed with the fact that this program since it started, and just like John said, there's a lot of committed people, there's a lot of participation in this, to redevelop it, to revitalize it, and now it's to, to enhance it, is to incorporate it back into the communities, into the schools. I mean, right now our focus has to be our children. Because of many things, I went to a boarding school, and you know, there's things that I experienced about speaking our language. My parents always talked about change. We all think if we don't change with who we are, we're always going to be stuck in that mentality of saying, I'm the poor Indian. I'm not going to succeed. I'm not going to win. And that's the only thing I've ever thought in my, in my everyday life was what my parents had told me, my grandparents. Yohonia, Manio, Tukela, Chanshna, Okeshna. Don't be afraid. And so those are the those are the words of wisdom and encouragement that I've always carried every day. And I'm proud to speak my language. Even in Texas. I spent a lot of time in Texas. And one of my daughters went to school down there and stayed down there. And I was down in four words at the stop show one day and they were speaking Spanish to me. So I la fuck you about. Got that my I'm not, I'm not, I don't speak Spanish. Where are you from? He I'm a Sioux from South Dakota. Wow, you guys are really in danger. So it gave me a sense of pride that our people have survived. And so I, I too still teach my grandchildren. I got my granddaughter who's been living in Texas now for, she's 10 years old, she's been down there for seven years. But thanks to this program here, my dictionary I gave to my granddaughter. She reads it, she researches it, she studies it. And if she can't pronounce a word, she'll call me. Papa, I need help with this word. So she's proud of her heritage. You know, she's, she's in the fourth grade and they're gonna move her to the fifth grade because number one thing is it really amazes me that even though Texas is the way it is, they have powwows down there. She's a jingle dress dancer. So she's proud of her heritage. She's proud of her language. I'm proud that with the, the direction that this here, this program has taken, I got a grandson of mine that goes to school in Porcupine. He's only seven years old. <clears throat> and when he comes to visit me on the weekends, he speaks the language. We sit there in simple terms and we have a conversation on the quota. And they, they were teaching him since he was in pre-kindergarten. So I have to commend the schools that are really incorporating this, this language, using this information to teach, it helps me teach my grandchildren to keep the pride of the existence of our language. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, any other comments or questions? In the platform. Can, you, can you say it again, please? Download in the platform. You don't need to download it because it's available. You know, you can, it's always, oh available online, so to download it would be difficult because the database is huge. You have to realize it has 40,000 uh, entries and it needs a, a strong computer server to run it, so uh, it's not downloadable. But in the future, we hope to create a version on a CD that would be local or we would have the sound and everything it would be local. You could install it on your, on your computer, but it depends on getting the grants for it because that's a lot of <coughs> extra work to do. Uh, but if you have internet connection, it's always available there for you. Okay, uh, Maggie? Um, Jan, in Shannon County, we do, um, we utilize pretty much every tool that you've created, and, and I know you know that. Um, one of the problems that we have is um, the frustration of the dictionary where you get three words, and I keep telling, and I, so I'm wondering, is there a way in which, um, like our children, when they're, they're trying to look up um, something on the dictionary, um, they're going to have to make an account, right? 
So how do we, uh, that becomes our conversation, is how do we protect them as um, minors in your forum? We can create some subsection for your minors. <coughs> we can uh, uh, limit their access to the forum of the adults, for example, it's easy to do. We can discuss that later on. Okay, that's, that was one of the things that comes up because we get three tries a day with the dictionary online and that's more functional for them than versus the I hard would, copy. Yeah, I would, however, uh, be a little conscious about using the online dictionary with uh, little elementary kids. I think it's better for middle school and, and high school. That's who uses it, middle school. Um, for a number of reasons. And I also think that you need to learn how to use the dictionary, both the printed and the online effectively. You know, the fact that you're given everything quickly and instantly can also be uh, slightly counterproductive to learning, okay? You need to find your own ways how you will memorize and remember words and not always count on the fact that, okay, if I want to know how to say a word, I'll look it up. Okay, that's a wrong use of a dictionary. The fact that it's available and I can look it up anytime. That's not how you should use a dictionary. Well, you need to find ways how you actually learn the words, and only when you're not certain, when you want to find a new one, then you look it up. Okay. And that, and what, we're, what we really use it for is for the orthography in itself, so that we're understanding how, how, that, um, sure. how it's written out. Yes. That's how, because we still have a lot of the older orthography. Um, some, even some of the teachers are still in that old orthography, right. so then we use that online That's dictionary good. to to find the correct. That's a good point. And if, if, you know, the, the text that I showed you, if you are a member of the forum and you create a text, you want to write your own text, it's also a way of a spell checker. Because if, if the word that you type is recognized by showing you the entry, that means you, you typed it well. It's spelled correctly. So it's, in a way, a spell checker. We are working on an independent spell checker too, but this, you know, in a way you can use it as a spell checker. So, is the word, um, this is enlarged too much so you can't see it, but the word is spelled correctly, then the dictionary entry will come up. So it's a spell checker. All right, any uh, other comments? The forum has a lot of sections I, I didn't go through them. There's a section on listening, there are a lot of the uh, recordings that we have made. You can listen to them here in this section. There are sections on reading or writing, sections on working with a word every week, a different word. So, uh, I mean, it's a complex, the forum is big and complex, and it can sometimes be perhaps even a little intimidating, but you can use it as a, as a resource, either for read it, reading or participating getting together with other people who, who are learning and, and so forth. So it's a resource and you have to find your own way how to utilize it. So uh, any other comments or questions on the dictionary? Or? <coughs> I have a question. Um, for a home that doesn't have anybody that's fluent, what would you recommend on how to begin to just try to learn on words that are used every day? or that are part of our everyday life with children. With children? Mm -hmm. Elementary age children. Uh, start with the books, level one book, level two book. Learn with the kids, stay one step ahead of them. Start with words, build on sentences that you can say. And always be one step ahead of what your kids know. Um, what are these level one and level Go two? through level two for pronunciation, that's a must. Unless you... The, are you talking level one, level two of this? Program? The curriculum that we've created, we now have there three is. levels of textbooks oh, okay. in the booth. So. Yeah, um, and the level one is sort of a picture dictionary that introduces children to semantic domains, and then level two is a thorough, consistent introduction to pronunciation and spelling. And you need to cover that. As an adult, you can cover it within two weeks. Listen to the CD, write the missing sounds, and that will give you a thorough introduction to Lakota pronunciation and the spelling system. And then you'll see that the spelling and the pronunciation support each other because they're <coughs> consistent. The spelling is based on the pronunciation. Okay, even though older speakers say, this is not how we 
right? It's simply that they don't know, they are not used to the fact that there is some age and something. But it supports itself, and we've seen it work as magic with kids. You know, now they no longer say Tatanka, as in Dances with Wolves, they are able to see, say, Tatanka because they see the sound spelled out. And that's the difference with the consistent orthography. And if native speakers tell you that they can read Lakota without it, it's just an excuse. They can't. I have seen it hundreds of times. I've seen it in my classes. I've been teaching uh, native speaking teachers for a number of years now. And I always give them a text written in the old orthography and ask them to read it, and then we'll discuss it in Lakota. And they don't know what they read. They have no clue what they read because they can't read it. Then I give them a text, and they spend like 20 minutes on one page. I give them a text written in the new orthography, even though they hadn't been introduced to it, they can read it. It's intuitive because it's based on the sound. I've tried this activity a number of times in my classes, always the same result. They can read it. So. Where do we get these level one? Where can we get the resources? To Order them online and. Well, thank you so much for coming to an uh, online dictionary uh, session. If you found anything interesting, spread the message. And if you find my controversial comments interesting, come to the next session. That's going to be even more interesting. <laughs>